Let us turn now in the word of God back to the portion of scripture which we read together. The book of Jordan chapter 2. And as the Lord enables, we'll consider the whole chapter, parts of it anyway. We'll take as our text the opening verse. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly. Most of us would have been very young when we first heard of Jonah in our scriptures. It was taught very early on in Sabbath schools and even in the family homes about this prophet that fled from the Lord to another country and on his way was cast into the sea, swallowed by a whale and cast back out onto the land. And there are many things we can take from the experience and words indeed of Jonah. One, one thing is that it's a real lesson to us about the sovereignty of God. It's a real lesson to us about how God deals with his people and performs his will in this world. There we have God giving a command to Jonah at the very start of the book. He was to go to Nineveh. And at, after all these events, what happens? He goes to Nineveh. King Nebuchadnezzar was quite right when he said about God, he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? Jonah thought by fleeing from the presence of the Lord that he would never need to go to Nineveh. And yet, in the sovereign power of God, he brings him there. Another important lesson of Jonah is how much he is a type of the Saviour. Christ himself, in his own ministry, mentions the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. We have that even, the, the simplest type is Christ being buried, being likened to Jonah, being swallowed up by the fish. But also Jonah's willingness even to be thrown into the sea to deliver others. Is that not to us a picture of Christ itself? He knew on the, on the ship the plight that the other sailors were in. And he knew that upon being cast down into the depths, he would deliver those sailors. We see so much in Jonah, typifying Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, and typifying the gospel, even going to the Gentiles, for he had to go to that great city of Nineveh. Jonah is, of course, also a good illustration to us of the experience of the believer, and we'll particularly look at that as we look at this second chapter particularly. We see much here that illustrates the, the process of conversion, initial coming to Christ, feeling the weight of sin, coming to the only one who can deliver you from that sin. There's a picture of backsliding, departing from the presence of the Lord and entering into despair in that way and being restored. And even just the experience of trials, dear Christian. Can we not see that? You may be in good standing before the Lord, and yet you may feel yourselves going through trying circumstances, humbling circumstances. Much can be taken even from this very chapter, and we'll hope in the will of the Lord to touch on a number of these points as we go through. The theme 
this morning is very simply Jonah's prayer. And we'll do so looking at three main headings. Despair, dependence, and deliverance. Despair, dependence, and deliverance. So first of all, then we'll look at despair. The despair of Jonah in the situation where he was in. Well, we know, of course, the origin of this situation. This was God sending chastisement for the sin of Jonah. He left, fled from the presence of the Lord. And the Lord is chastising him for it. And Jonah, of course, in the first instance, realizes this. He, we are told, told the crew his own faults in verse 10 of the previous chapter. He knew the reason of the storm. He was very open to them. This is all happening because I fled from the presence of the Lord. He was very open about that. He was willing to be thrown into the sea for it. And yet, while he was physically put into the sea by the the sailors on the boat, in this prayer, what does he say? In verse 3, For thou hast cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas. Jonah knew that although the sailors threw him in, that he was thrown in by God. In his eyes, it was judgment and just judgment for his rebellion and his sin. The psalmist says, Upon me both day and night, thine hand did heavy lie. There are many things that we can point to that are the cause of our afflictions. Most of them are caused by ourselves. But you can acknowledge the Lord is using them. Using them in the same way that he used the afflictions of Jonah. And we must also see things this way. We must see the Lord's hand and will in whatever circumstances we may be going through. We must see him as the ultimate author of them and also to see them, see in it his good and glorious purpose. Because we are not, are we not prone to to blame others. That Christian said something nasty to me. That minister said something offhand. Maybe that word was a word in season to speak to you. You must ask yourselves, am I living in the will of God? Jonah knew he wasn't. Therefore he knew that this Chastisement was true, right, and just. And then, he's, of course, he is thrown into the sea. And he says in verse 3, The floods compassed me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. We, of course, know that as soon as Jonah was thrown into the sea, that there was a calm. But that calm was only for the boat. For Jonah, there was no calm. The waves were going over his head. We think of that and think of that awful situation that that man was in. That is a most fearful situation to be cast into the sea with no hope of being extracted. And for a while, you can imagine, we can connect to this, him kicking and trying to swim and keep himself at the surface. You can imagine him doing that. The sea is a most distressful place and this is the body's natural reaction to being in such a predicament. His hands and feet clawing as it were just to the waves, using as it were his own strength to try and survive. Also, another effect is that his sense of direction would have been affected. If you're being tossed around in the sea, you certainly wouldn't know where north is, south, east, or west. You wouldn't know where anything is. You wouldn't know what is to the right hand or to the left. And you do not know even what is 
below you. And this is man's natural response. We seek to deliver ourselves. Seems to be the first place we go is to our own works. We have to help ourselves. We need to extract ourselves from this situation we find ourselves in. And this is true as a non-Christian and often as a believer. Friend, in these despairing times, do you not feel you lost your sense of direction as Jonah did in these, in the waves and in the sea? You don't know where deliverance also is coming from. Such is the weight of your sin or the weight of your trial. But then, of course, he moves further into despair. Moves into, into a place of complete helplessness. Verse 5, the waters compassed me about, even to the soul. Even to the soul. The situation worsens yet still. And he's, he's described as sinking even down to the very depths. His trial had passed beyond merely the senses. It, wasn't no, it was no more a physical trial of staying afloat. It was now a trial of the soul. The waters may have been lapping over his head, but he felt them even down to his very soul. And you can imagine him, as it were, sinking down, deeper and deeper into it. And you can picture as well, as someone sinks into the sea, it gets darker. You see less and less. Also the pressure increases the deeper you go. This is where Jonah was heading. And we can know that as well, the heaviness of conviction of sin, the heaviness of trial. But he even reaches the very bottoms of the mountains as we are told. That is a picture of you can't get any deeper than that. He is as deep as anyone can possibly be. He is in the darkest place that anyone could possibly be. And he's under the most pressure that anyone could possibly be. And what does he conclude? When he's in this situation, verse 4. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight. The Lord has no part with me. I am cast out of thy sight. John Gill said, Jonah knew that he was under the eye of God's omniscience, but not his eye of providence. Jonah fled from the presence of the Lord, and now he felt that the Lord's presence had fled from him. This is the level of despair that Jonah found himself in. Think of King Hezekiah similarly, who said, regarding his sickness, I said in the cutting off of my days, I shall go to the gates of the grave. I am deprived of the residue of my years. I said, I shall not see the Lord, even the Lord, in the land of the living. He will cut me off with pining sickness. From day even to night, wilt thou make an end of me. Even Hezekiah, finding himself in despair. And this is the soul in sin. The soul in sin can only sink deeper and deeper in it. Verse 5, the depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. The weeds of sin, wrapping more and more around your body. Around your head, as Jonah puts it. The longer you're in this situation, whether you're a Christian or a non-Christian, the more the weeds will go around about your eyes that you cannot see the answer. The more the, they'll close about your mouth that you cannot speak of the answer. You cannot pray to God. They'll close over your ears that you cannot hear the sweet words and the promises of God in the Scriptures. Such are the weeds of sin. This is the place of absolute despair that even Jonah 
found himself in. And at the end of this point, it's very important to know something very, very important. As deep as Jonah was, Christ went deeper. Christ went deeper. Jonah may have been in the midst of the seas. But Christ went into, as it were, the heart of the earth. Christ went deeper than Jonah to redeem him. No depths that you can get into, you can find yourselves in, are so deep that Christ's redeeming hand cannot reach down and grasp. We read of the man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, because he has borne our sorrows and taken our griefs upon himself. What a saviour this is, entered into greater despair than we've been talking about, to be a perfect redeemer, even for rebellious Jonah, at the very depths of the sea. So we've looked at despair. Secondly, we'll look at dependence. Dependence. Jonah prays to the Lord. Jonah, the very one who famously fled, now flees back, now returns from the place he found himself in. Found, found himself in. You think, dear friend, of the location of this prayer. In the very belly of a fish, in the depths of the sea. And we, of course, don't know when this fish came. It could have been that it took him up as soon as he went into the sea, in which case everything we spoke of before is then talking about the internal parts of the fish and the fish going down into the deeps with him, depths with him. Either way, it's a resounding miracle whether he was kept alive from the very surface in the belly of the fish for three days or if he was even still alive in the very depths of the ocean. But this fish was the very vehicle that God used to deliver Jonah. And this fish became, as it were, a house of prayer. Here we have Jonah, unimaginable to have a man be in such a situation and yet uttering such words to God in prayer. Hutchison said, Faith in a time of need will find a way through many a dark impediment in order to find God. You think of Job. There he was in that time in much complaint at the dealings of his friends with him, concluding eventually that God had forsaken him. And just at the very moment you might have thought he was going to curse God, the very moment he was going to do what the devil had predicted him to do, he said, I know that my Redeemer liveth. Faith will find a way even in despair and even in such a unique circumstance as Jonah. His mouth was opened in the belly of that fish. That mouth which was closed in guilt, opened by grace to cry unto the Lord. Psalm 51, my closed lips, O Lord, by thee, let them be opened. Matthew Henry said, Knowledge of God's good will toward us, even with our sins, gives us boldness of access to him and opens the lips in prayer, which were closed in guilt. Jonah knew he was guilty. He knew he was guilty of the sin that he committed. Yet, in that despair, he cries to the Lord. Friend, remember this. You can pray in any situation and you will have an ear from heaven. Even if you're engulfed in darkness, immersed in the depths of your sin, under great, great bondage to your sin, you can pray to God. 
And the wonderful thing is, you can even pray this prayer. Jonah's situation was unique, but his prayer wasn't. I believe it was said in one of the commentaries, every statement Jonah makes in this chapter is from the Psalter. Jonah's situation was unique, but not his prayer. All these things that Jonah prays are common to all believers. We all enter into despair, whether that be when we first came to Christ, if we backslide or if we're under trial, we can pray this delightful prayer. And he, of course, opens his mouth and remembers his God. Verse 7, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. I remembered the Lord. The capitalized Lord word there, of course, means Jehovah, the covenant God. Covenant God. We, so often when we see our situations, come to hasty and wrong conclusions about God's dealings with us. The psalmist in Psalm 77 said, Hath God forgotten to be gracious? Hath he in anger shut up his tender mercies? And then there's an important Selah. And he goes on to say, And I said, This is my infirmity. But I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. He remembered the Lord. But he, of course, remembered he was his God. His God that saved him in the first place. The same God that saved him was the one he was praying to to deliver him, that he was depending on in this situation. At the very opening of our service, we sung from Psalm number 18. And how many times does the psalmist in that opening couple of verses claim of his ownership of God, that is a personal God. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. The psalmist there, borderline overemphasizing his ownership of God and God's ownership of him. And he looks to this God and prays. Verse 4, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. We said earlier, did we not, that he lost all sense of direction as we all would. Which temple is he talking about here? We know it's not the physical temple in Jerusalem. He would not know which direction that is in. We also said when we talk about uh, loss of sense of direction, you wouldn't know what's below you. But you know where up is. I will look again toward thy holy temple, the very temple in heaven. Psalm 11, the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. And Psalm 5, but as for me, I will come into thy house in the multitude of thy mercy. There was no cry that he could give loud enough to reach the temple in Jerusalem. But the Lord's temple in heaven can hear even the cries of those in the deepest and darkest of places, even where Jonah found himself in. Cries to God out of the depths. And what does he find? An ear ever inclined to hear him. God's ear was not stopped to Jonah. It was ever inclined to hear his prayer. And God's ear is not stopped to you if you find yourself in such a situation. It is ever opened to hear the cry of the penitent, ever inclined to hear the humble cry unto him out of the depths. 
So that was dependence. Thirdly and finally, we'll look at deliverance. Despair, dependence, and deliverance. We have a prayer answered. A prayer answered. Verse 2, And he heard me. And thou heardest my voice. Isn't it amazing, friends, that the Lord's mercy knows no bounds? How did he describe it? Out of the belly of hell, he described it. Of course, that is the same word that would mean the grave in the Old Testament. That is how dead Jonah felt. That is how lifeless Jonah felt. He was effectively in the grave, dead. But yet, out of the grave, into the very throne room, throne room of heaven, his prayer reaches. And it is met kindly. John Gill said, his prayer was met with a kind reception and a gracious answer. Friend, never stop praying. Never stop praying. Quite often we think that the Lord, because we're guilty, will not hear us. We often close our mouths, as we've already touched on in our guilt. Friend, know at this time that if you come in humble repentance to God, his ear is opened to you at any time. Not just in the public means of grace as we are here. Not just in the prayer meeting. But any moment you call upon him, his ear is inclined to you. We have his life brought from corruption because he answered that very prayer. Verse 6, Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption. Your thought immediately goes to Christ. And that verse in Psalm 16, Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. We'll sing that towards the end of the service. But Jonah was not given over to death. He was not left in that situation, even though he cried. Not left in that situation. I shall not die, the psalmist says, but live, and shall the works of God discover. The Lord hath me chastised sore, but not to death given over. Jonah depends on God and is delivered. And wonderfully, his sin is removed. His sin is removed. Jonah may have been taken out of the depths of the sea, but his sins, as it were, remained. What does the prophet say? Micah, he will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities. And thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Never to be seen again. Again, Hezekiah, we spoke of his despair. And now we speak of his peace moments later. Behold, for peace I had great bitterness, but thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption, for thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. Sins cast away. Jonah delivered from the sea and delivered even from his sin. And if this is the case, dear Christian, and it certainly is for you, you will not and cannot be forsaken. Even Jonah's disobedience, even Jonah ending up in the very depths of the sea, shrouded in darkness of the weeds encircling his head, could not separate him from the love of God, which was in Christ Jesus our Lord. We have that list, do we not, in Romans 8. Nothing shall separate between God and his people. This was certainly true of Jonah. And what does 
Jonah say right as he is about to be delivered from the belly of the fish. He acknowledges the Lord's sovereignty once again. But this time in this form, verse 9, salvation is of the Lord. Salvation is of the Lord. He said, did he not, or attributed the chastisement to God's authorship. This chastisement came from the very hand of God itself. He would not dare do that and not attribute the salvation to that same God, the God who saves, the God who delivers from sin. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because we are told his compassions fail not. Jehovah is salvation. Isn't that interesting that that is effectively the very etymology of our Saviour's name in this world? Jesus means Jehovah is salvation. There are many who say we don't sing his name enough. We sing it all the time. The Lord is salvation. And he covenants with God. Verse 9, I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I have pay. I will pay that I have vowed. Commits himself to God and his cause. Will do what he says. Having known the extent of his disobedience. And we must do so likewise. Commit ourselves to the Lord. Do what he would have us to do. Present our bodies, as we are told in Romans, as a living sacrifice, which is your reasonable service. This is what Jonah vowed to do in this very chapter. Just a few thoughts, then, as we conclude. This is true of the believer, but also everyone uh, to an extent. Understand the severity of fleeing from the presence of the Lord. When Jonah did that, he might have thought, he might have been tempted to think that there was no consequences to that decision. Indeed, that might have been strengthened when he went to the jetty and there was a boat there. Not only is there no consequences, there's actually a providence for me to go where I'm wanting to go. The Lord has provided me a vehicle to get me away from his presence. Understand the severity of fleeing from his presence. That there is consequences to denying his commands. And there is grave consequences to denying his gospel. Flee not from the gospel. Hear, unbeliever, if you hear it. Because you will forsake mercy at your own peril. It's what he says in verse 8, is it not? They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. Friend, if you are still in your sin, you are still in the weeds. Those weeds are encircling you more and more each and every day. They're closing your mouth closing round your eyes, your ears. Less and less will get in and they'll strengthen. Their roots will go deeper. The strength of them will increase. That is the only way that this may go, unless you are delivered from that place. If you are someone who is feeling like they've backslidden, someone that is distant from the Lord. And this is a proper public backsliding. What are you to do? Well, you're to do what Jonah did as well. William Gurnall said quite solemnly, none will have such a sad parting from Christ as those who went halfway with him and then left him. Know your situation, dear backslider. Did you know the nearness, the, 
the comfort of the love of Christ and you've turned from it. That can only end in despair unending. Jonah had, as it were, a happy ending. We know the whole story. In so much so that we can look at the despair knowing that he's going to be delivered so it's not as hard to read. Friend, your despair will never end. There's no deliverance from that despair. But no, be encouraged. Be encouraged today. God will love you freely. He said that, did he not, to backsliding Israel. I will love them freely. And heal them from their backsliding. Know that the Lord will deliver. And dear Christian here, under trials, pray to the Lord for perseverance. Trust in the Lord for deliverance from them. And know most of all that he is with you in them. Even though you might not feel it, the Lord is the one sustaining you, keeping you in the faith, keeping you looking to him. And remember as well, the trial that you may be in was authored by him. It might not be as it was for Jonah because of chastisement of sin. It might be just to bring further fruits out of you. But remember, God is the author of it. And he is the ender of it. Did the, the fish vomit out Jonah on its own volition? Or did God speak to the fish and it vomited him out? The storm has changed into a calm, as the psalmist says, at his command and will. When he wills it, he will end it. May the Lord bless these few thoughts to us this morning. Let us unite our hearts in prayer. <coughs> o most merciful and gracious God, we give thanks for the example provided to us in Jonah. But there is much in his own experience that we can so often liken ourselves to. We see our own rebellion. We, so, we see our own desire to do our own will and to take our own path. O oh Lord, we give thanks that trials and chastisements and all these necessary things are from the Lord. And we, O oh Lord, give thanks even greater still that salvation is by grace, that it is all of the Lord. And we lean upon that heavily this morning. For we know that in and of ourselves we are even as an unclean thing. Lord, we pray, cleanse us from our every sin. Forgive us for all these things, even in holy things that were amiss. And go before us, the remainder of this day. Pardon our sins, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen. May the Lord bless the remainder of this day to us.